Welcome to the channel today guys. Today we're going to be talking about car loans and why that is killing your wealth. So we're going to go ahead and dive through a couple examples of how much your car loan is actually costing you. We're going to go through depreciation and we're also going to go through why a car is not really an asset but a liability. In most cases, in some cases it can be an asset. So if you enjoy the content, think about liking and subscribing and we're going to dive through why I will never be having a car payment. So first we kind of need to make some definitions of numbers that we're going to be using here. So the 5.27%. That is the average amount paid on a car loan. Granted, this could be lower now with the interest rates being at like record lows right now, right? But 5.27%, that's the average car loan that's out there right now. So that's the number we're gonna use for percentage wise. Within your first year of owning the vehicle, it's gonna lose 20 to 30% of its value. And all these numbers have a large variance based on uh, if you like smoke in the vehicle, condition of vehicle, mileage on the vehicle, all of these different kinds of things but we're just kind of going to use averages here. So 20 to 30% in that first year is going to go right with the wind there. After five years, the vehicle has lost 60% of its value. So over half of the value of the purchasing price of a brand new vehicle, keep that in mind, is now evaporated into thin air as if it's vanished. So let's go ahead and throw a situation on the board here. So up on the board here, we have a situation for you. We have the 2021 Putt Putt Butternut XL Quad Cab with Mega Blast X3 with three E's. Mm. So you have a 2021 Putt Putt Butternut and that is going for $25,000. That is a pretty stinking flaming deal on the Putt Putt Butternut, I must say. Very popular vehicle. So 25K, you're gonna be buying your Putt Putt Butternut and then after five years of payments, how much have you paid on the Putt Putt Butternut. So you've ended up paying $28,493 for your Putt Putt Butternut. Now what on average is this thing worth now? So on average, it's worth 10K. And now what are you gonna do in 2026 when your vehicle's five years old? You might just repeat the cycle. Rinse and repeat, even though you're out on this deal about 18 grand on your Pup Pup Butternut. So you're gonna rinse, repeat, you're probably gonna trade it in for less than it's even worth. So you might be out even more money than that. So let's throw up a couple more scenarios on the board here. So Matt, why does this all matter? Why does it matter that I'm losing a ton of money on this Pup Pup Extreme with three E's? Like, why does all this matter? So let's go ahead and dive into why this vehicle is now a liability. It's not an asset, it's a liability, and what it could have been if you would have spent that money on an actual asset. Asset, I said that funny. So let's go ahead and dive in. So initially you spent that $25,000 on your 2021 Putt Putt Extreme. After five years, it's worth $10,000. And this is a liability that could end up costing you more money. You have to pay insurance on it. That's a cost that I didn't calculate into this. You have to pay maintenance on it. You have to pay you know, fuel. Granted, you know, you're gonna probably have a vehicle of some sort anyway where these things all will apply. But on a newer vehicle, it could be more expensive, could be more reliable, you know, whatnot. But there are gonna be other things that make this a liability. It's depreciating, which makes it a liability. It's gonna have extra costs. It's gonna have maintenance. You're gonna need new tires, you know, all that stuff. It's a liability versus having an asset. So let's say you take that $25,000, you have 25K outright, and you just buy that vehicle, which is great. You're saving on all that interest. And if it's a small portion of your net worth, then that's just fine. And I'd say, hey, go for it, it's your money. Do you do you. So after five years, you buy it outright for $25,000, it's now worth $10,000. Now let's say you put that $25,000 into let's say an ETF that mirrors the market, just to keep it simple. So the SPY just mirrors the S&P 500. You just dump $25,000 into that. Five years later, you take a look. So after the first year, your $25,000, whoop, let's write that up there, 25K. After the first year, your 25K is now worth $27,000. Whoo, two grand -o in the bank, what's up with that? After your second year, it's just north of 29, third year, 31, fourth year, 34, and fifth year, $36,000, almost $37,000. So that $25,000 over the course of five years has now paid you $12,000. And 8% is, I guess, especially with the SPY, it's kind of conservative, but I do want to play a little bit conservative. I don't want to give unrealistic returns like 10, 12% per year or whatever, but... So kind of a little bit more of a safe return in the market, granted there can be some downside to this, but this is an asset. This is something that should gain value. You're not having to pay to do anything with this money. You're just letting it sit. You're collecting dividends and you're gaining this money like over the course of time, which is great. So what is the difference between these two? If you decide to spend this $25,000 on a vehicle versus just investing it, well now you're out $26,000 of the difference there 
of how much you've paid for this vehicle. And if you're making consistent car payments on a vehicle, that's money you can't plug into the market and turn that money into an asset versus a liability. So $26,000 of difference here in having an asset versus a liability. And I understand people need vehicles and we're gonna cover that in our next points here. So we'll dive into what I think should be done and how you can kind of stop this cycle of poorness when it comes to vehicle loans. So realize when I'm saying this, guys, I'm not a financial planner. I just like looking at numbers and just trying to end the cycle of poorness related to cars. So things I would recommend, uh, but not necessarily advise, but things I would recommend are at least things that I do. Paying cash for a vehicle. Now, I understand that this is not reasonable. Like a lot of people don't just have ten dollars to $15,000 in their bank account to go ahead and pay cash for a vehicle. But, you know, if you don't have that much money and you don't have a large net worth, then you probably shouldn't be driving a very expensive, fancy vehicle. You should probably be driving something that's, you know, within the $5,000, $10,000 range or less than $5,000. Just try and pay cash for that vehicle. And if you can't pay cash, make sure it's not a large chunk of money that you're going to go ahead and be putting towards this vehicle that can't generate you more money in the future. And you should also be focusing on debts, but that's a different, different topic. Uh, liability. So vehicles in most cases are a liability. They're going to depreciate in most cases. And when I say in most cases, I follow the prices of, let's say, a 1965 Fastback Mustang or a night, you know, a muscle car of some sort because I like looking into those. So in those cases, for those vehicles, those actually will appreciate in value. There's still the upkeep, the insurance, so there still are fees, but I wouldn't necessarily call those a liability because they could be just a way to di differentiate your wealth at that point. So not in all cases a liability here. But in most cases, so any vehicle that's going to be like your daily driver that you're driving all the time, that you're going to go ahead and put a lot of mileage on, that you're buying that's newer, they're going to be a liability. They're going to sink in value, and that's also going to take money out of your pocket. So my recommendation, what I always do is buy something that's already been passed that like heavy, heavy, heavy hit of depreciation. So you can still get something very, very nice with relatively low miles that is five or six years old, and it's past that 60% depreciation point. So now you're buying still a relatively nice vehicle that will last you, you know, at least five more years, hopefully, that is in decent shape. And you can get a good deal on it if you look and you're not paying all of that depreciation. Hopefully you're paying for cash and now you're not paying that interest. But really, a good chunk of your money should not be into vehicles. It should be in investing and lowering debt. So try and get something that's past its big points of depreciation. Make sure that is a small chunk of your net value. So... When you're picturing all of the things that you own in your net value, this, this is how much money I have in my home, this is how much money I have in retirement, these are all my debts. When you add all that money up, make sure vehicles are less than like roughly five to 10%, I believe is what David Ramsey says, don't quote me on that. Five to 10% of your value should be your vehicles. Now, why do they say such a low percent should be in vehicles? Well, for the most part, it's depreciating, it's a liability, it's not an asset. So you wouldn't want most of your net wealth to be going down in value. So that makes sense to me where you wouldn't want most of your value to go down. Where with a home, some say a home is a liability. It depends on if you read Robert Kiyosaki or not. But uh, with a home, it should be appreciating in value. So I see it more as an asset instead of a liability, but that's also on the table for debate too. But anyway, keep it as a small chunk of your net value. And there are also more costs that incur with a vehicle than anticipated. So when you're writing out the numbers, how much do I think I can afford? Keep in mind, like with a brand new vehicle, you're going to have to be paying tip top insurance for that. You're going to have to be keeping it up to date. And you don't really own that vehicle. The bank owns that vehicle. So you're going to want to make sure it's in good shape and you want to make sure you're making payments on it. And they're going to have certain stipulations they need, like good insurance if the bank owns that vehicle. So overall, I do believe that vehicles are killing wealth in America just because we are paying an appreciating amount for a depreciating asset. So that's basically what I have for you. Try and buy something that's you know past this amount of depreciation. Make sure it's a small chunk of your net value. Try and pay cash for it if you can. If you have to take out payments, that's okay. But uh, try and keep it as a small chunk of your net value. So if you enjoy the content, think about subscribing. A little bit different than what I'm used to talking to. And hopefully we'll save some money on vehicles here. So thanks for watching.